Hey guys, Adam here in the AeroWorks Workshop, and today I want to do something a little different with the weekly build series, and let's talk about why I chose the Zenith CH750 Super Duty, or for that matter, why would you choose any kit aircraft? Well, when, you, when you're thinking about building your own aircraft, there are several factors you're going to want to consider. I've broken those down into four categories. The first one being, what is your mission? What is the cost to build the aircraft? What is the difficulty of building the aircraft? And then lastly, what kind of support do you get from the aircraft manufacturer or the kit manufacturer? So let's break these down into each individual one. All right, the first and most important item to consider when building and selecting your kit aircraft is what is your mission? We talk about that all the time in regular general aviation. You know, what is the mission that we're flying? You know, if your mission is to fly from Texas to California weekly on a business trip, you probably don't want to build a stole aircraft. You're probably going to want something that's better for cross countries. If your mission is flying in the back country to go camping or landing on riverbeds, then you're probably not going to want to have a composite sleek aircraft that goes 160 knots. So you really have to start narrowing down and figuring out what you want to do with your aircraft and know that not one aircraft fits all builders. And that's why we see a lot of times in the uh, experimental aircraft uh, industry is that kit builders become serial builders. They end up building, you know, a, an RV six, and then they build, uh, you know, something else and an RV 10 and a Zenith this and a Zenith that. So not one aircraft fits every mission. And if you have the ability to build other aircraft or build one and sell one and, you know, go on like that, you'll see that a lot where builders are on their third or fourth airplane. So that's pretty common. But back to the mission, what is your mission? What do you plan to do most of the time? Do you need an aircraft that can carry a family of four? Do you only need to carry yourself and one passenger? Do you only want to carry yourself? Uh, do you want something that's aerobatic or that goes high speed? Do you want something that goes very slow? Um, do you want something that has great visibility? You know, there's a lot of different things you have to consider. So for my, uh, my selection, the reason I narrowed it down to the Zenith 750 Super Duty is I originally was going to build, you know, I've looked at everything from back when the first BD4 jet came out to the first Kit Foxes to everything in between. Originally had my heart set on an RV-8, um, but because of where I live and the type of mission that I fly, it probably wasn't going to be the best suited for my daily mission. So I started looking at Stoll aircraft, and if you're not familiar with Stoll, that stands for short takeoff and landing. Uh, and in that category, you have things like the Rans aircraft, you have the Kit Fox, obviously the entire Zenith line. Um, and you know, I started narrowing down, okay, you start to bring that group to a smaller group, and then you start weaning out the other options. And sometimes you're gonna find out that kit manufacturers, uh, when you start talking about availability, support, cost, that helps you kind of wean down. So I am going to run through each individual item that I talked about earlier, but for me on the Zenith aircraft, I had to look at all those items we talked about. So my mission was, I definitely wanted to carry at least one passenger, in this case with the Super Duty and the rear jump seat, I can carry three passengers, maybe even four if I had two of my little kids in the back, but definitely three or two get big guys and some luggage. So that was a plus. I wanted something that I could potentially land on my 15 acre farm. So that was something that could do. Um, the cost was right in there. We're gonna get more into depth on the cost in a minute, but the cost was something that I could afford. Um, the difficulty level uh, being that the majority, if not all of the aircraft is uh, constructed with what we call pole rivets or blind rivets. Some people call them pop rivets, uh, meaning that one person can do the riveting by their, themselves. So when you compare that to something like a Vans aircraft, that's sleek and smooth and everything's flush, not only does that the difficulty level go way up, but in a lot of cases it requires two people to construct the aircraft. And when you're already maybe limited on time, uh, maybe you only get a couple hours at night or a few hours on the weekend to build your aircraft, and then you got to factor in having a second person that also has time, that can really extend your complete overall build time of the aircraft. And you've got guys building Vans aircraft that are four, five, ten years building these aircraft, you know. And now some of them are perfectionists, and that's fine, but I needed something that I could see the goal, I could see the end in sight when I started it. And we know that when you start building a Zenith, you can't really go more than a few hours and you start seeing parts come together 
and you're starting to create something. So, you know, what we have behind me is, is the compilation of a couple weeks of work. So, uh, obviously for me, the cost was a factor. Um, the quality and the build uh, of the kit was great. Um, and the big thing too, when we talk about support, is there has been a lot of companies, in, in mainly in the, the early 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s, that the kit manufacturers came out, they had great marketing, they produced a, an awesome fuselage kit, and they had some component kits, people invested in the company, and then two years later, the company went bankrupt and is nowhere to be found. And that left a lot of builders with an unfinished fuselage in their garage, no other parts to be made, and either having to you know, chalk it up to a waste of money or, you know, fabricate parts themselves. So when you're looking at a kit company, kit aircraft company, you know, how long have they been in business? How many aircraft, not only have they sold, but how many are actually flying? And when you look at Vans aircraft and Zenith aircraft and, and other major aircraft manufacturers, we're talking about thousands of aircraft, not only sold, but flying. And the support from, from a company like Zenith that's been around 20 to 30 years, uh, was a big factor to me. So again, we go back to the mission. It fit the mission for me. Um, the difficulty level of building it with the blind rivets and the fact that one person could do the majority of the riveting, that was a factor. The, the ease and, and how it goes together uh, was a big thing for me. And then knowing that I had Xena support um, you know, throughout the build. So when you're building an aircraft, you hopefully have a set of plans, you have instructions, a build assembly guide of some type. But when you do run into something that just doesn't make sense, um, you know, can you call the company? Do they answer back right away? Or does it take them two weeks to give you a canned response and saying, well, we're, we're really busy, uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Well, that can affect your build. If, you, if you've only got those two hours a night to go out and build an aircraft and you run into a, a roadblock, and now you have to wait a week to get an answer, well, that, that's gonna extend your build tremendously. So those are things you wanna keep in mind as you go through that. Let's talk a little bit about cost of an aircraft. Now we have, you know, we're not all Mike Patey. We don't have, you know, we're not, we don't belong to the Super Club a Week uh, Club like he does. But when you talk about cost of a kid aircraft, whatever you see that published advertised price, don't be confused that that's all it's going to cost you to build that aircraft. So let's just take a round number, $25,000. That's a, a kind of an entry level uh, kit plane. You know, there's a lot of uh, Zenith aircraft that can be built in that range. Uh, Vans aircraft, you'll see a kit price, 25, 32,000. That looks great. You're like, wow, I could get an airplane for less than my car costs. Know that the average is three times that amount. So if you buy a $25,000 airplane, you're going to be spending about $25,000 on an engine and about twenty dollars to $25,000 on instruments, accessories, and those extra stuff. And we haven't even talked about paint, we haven't talked about tools, um, and all the miscellaneous parts and pieces you may have to buy. So you need to factor in, in your cost and in your aircraft kit selection, what is this actually gonna cost me? Yes, I may be able to buy the kit for thirty grand, but I'm gonna be spending another sixty grand finishing the kit. So you need to kind of multiply that or do the, the, the one-third ratio, you know, one-third kit, two-thirds, or, or another third is the engine, and the last third is the instruments, avionics, radios, that kind of stuff. And again, there's, a, there's, there's extras on top of that if you want to go crazy with paint and extra equipment and all kinds of stuff. So those are the factors to keep in mind when you're considering the cost of a kit aircraft. All right, let's talk a little bit about difficulty level. I talked about the Zenith aircraft behind me and that it's all done with pole rivets, which are blind rivets, meaning that when you have two pieces of metal together with a hole in them, you put the blind rivet in, you put a tool up to it, you pull the rivet from the outside, it mushrooms on the inside, the two pieces go together tight, the stem breaks off, and you have a rivet done. When you start talking about flush rivets, not only do you have to drill all your holes, dimple all your holes, which basically puts a, a countersunk looking hole in there, deburr all your holes, and then flush rivet, which means you have to have a rivet gun on the face of the rivet and the skin, and a bucking bar, which is basically just a piece of steel in all various shapes and sizes. On the back side, you hold the rivet gun against the flush rivet, and as you're squeezing that rivet gun, and it's doing, you know, however you have it set for the, the pounding on it, the bucking bar bounces off the back and smushes out the rivet. Now, 
that's, you know, when we're talking just about one rivet, we're talking the difference of I squeeze a gun on my pull rivet gun and it's done to, okay, my, my hammer's on the, the, the face of the rivet. Are you, is the bucking bar in there, John? Yeah, it's in there. Okay, here I go. How's it look? Ah, one more click. You're talking thousands of rivets like that. You're, you're extending your time exponentially. So, uh, you know, just with riveting, pop rivets, flush rivets, blind rivets, whatever you want to call them, versus flush rivets, huge time savings when you go with an aircraft like Zenith. Now, we haven't even got into things like composite aircraft, like you see on Mike Patey's channel, where he's got, uh, you know, um, his sleek, fast airplanes, like turbulence and those. Those are all composite, carbon fiber, fiberglass. We're talking about laying up layers and layers of material, using epoxy, sanding. That's a whole nother level of construction right there. So, again, those, those main factors you have to think about when it comes to the difficulty level are what type of riveting am I doing? Or am I doing composite work? Am I doing fabric work, like on a kit fox, where you have a tube uh, construction, an airframe that's wrapped in what we call aircraft fabric, and then it is basically glued on to the tubing, then it's shrunk down, then it's stitched, then it's primed, then it's painted. Very strong, but again, a whole different type of build process. Something that you can't just throw a sheet on the side like you can on this and shoot some rivets in and you're done. You're talking about a whole different process there. So you need to think about that difficulty level, what you have experience doing versus what you, what you might have to pay somebody to do or you may have to learn yourself. All right, lastly, guys, we're going to talk a little bit about support. You want to make sure you have a kit manufacturer that has a solid reputation of supporting the customers, whether that be through tech support calls, getting you parts when you mess up a part or you're missing a part. Um, and that have the, the support team that can support you throughout the build. Do they have an 800 number? Do they have a tech support line? Do they have online forums? Do they have an email you know, system that works? So it's important to ask when you're choosing your aircraft, ask the company, what kind of tech support do you have? What kind of availability do they have throughout the week? What if I have a question at midnight? You know, do I have to email? Um, you know, do you have a specialized forum just for that? Don't forget about things like the Facebook groups. Um, just for this aircraft, I, I started the uh, CH-750 Super Duty Builders Group. So if you're building one of these planes, get on there, sign up, and uh, you know we're sharing photos throughout our builds. You can toss questions off each other. Sometimes as kit manufacturers uh, have gotten busier, and Zenith is no, no uh, different than anybody else, um, you know, where you're talking about eight weeks out to get a kit. Uh, last I heard, Kit Fox was about 18 months out and all different you know, in between. Um, you want to make sure that not only do they sell the aircraft, but they can support you throughout your build. So guys, I hope this was informative, a little bit shorter video today. Make sure you like and subscribe and uh, keep tuned in as we are building our aircraft. We're still finishing up a few things here. Got the tail all riveted up, all the bracing back there. I actually test fit the rudder uh, earlier in the week just to make sure that everything was lined up, looking really good. And uh, we're going to be continuing to proceed on. And I think you're going to see some big changes in the next episode, so make sure you tune in for that. Again, share the video, like the video, appreciate you watching, and uh, next time we'll see you on the next video.